Hello everyone, Joshua Gilliland here, one of the founding attorneys of the Legal Geeks. With me is Gabby Martin for our double feature this evening of starting with Loki and then at seven, we're gonna jump into Bad Batch with Steve Chu and Christina. And so yeah, lots of fun this evening when it comes to legal analysis. Gabby, how's life? Life is good. Um, we're back in the building at work. Uh, so that's a transition. And I'm also still reeling. Uh, this was a good week for Marvel. I mean, we had a Loki episode. We have the last Loki episode next week. Um, and we had Black Widow drop. Uh, so it's a good time to be a Marvel fan. And I'm hoping that with the next episode, the final episode of Loki, we get some more uh, information and trailers, hopefully, of some other marvel uh stuff that's dropping uh namely spider-man uh hawkeye um i'd like to see some some trailers finally we've been patient we've been patient long enough <laughs> yeah, I, it could be the weekend of san diego comic-con at home they could also be waiting for the end of loki and loki this episode might have given the explanation on how loki could have survived san thanos yep and that, or I, I'm, congratulations to all the like nerds out there who predicted that and who theorized about that that loki could have made himself into a piece of dust and wasn't actually um you know killed so kudos to those people because i would not have i i was very much of you know once somebody's neck snapped that's done, but then again, I'm also a Sherlock fan, so I should know by now that like, just because <laughs> somebody's brains get blasted out means absolutely nothing. Um, and some just because somebody falls off a roof means nothing. So um, yeah, we should know that by now. We should, we should have our stuff together, especially when it comes to Loki. Loki never dies. Yeah, the, his mantra is surviving. And with that, let's talk about the many legal issues and <laughs> Easter eggs that are through throughout this episode, because this is, it was completely fortuitous that I made a reference to Journey into Mystery last week, because I did not know the episode title. So that was fun uh, that they went to the comic where Thor premiered. And watching this, I started thinking, about the TVA. They, far we know, kidnap people, put them on a show trial, and then either, you know, send them to the void as a form of punishment, or they're pressed into service to work for the TVA as slaves. So let's talk about how to sue the TVA. And yes, this will be a blog post of you know as well. But uh Let's talk about all the different causes of action and then how to deal with suing a temporal agency. <laughs> big jurisdictional and venue issue <laughs> that get way complicated. Uh, that, yeah. That forum. But never fear. Nobody is above the law. Nobody. <laughs> yeah. not, not in the legal geeks courtroom. Nobody is above the law. It's it, like, oh, hell no, you don't get to do that. So <laughs> I mean, just out of the gate, these were the legal issues that I saw that you get kidnapping, negligent infliction of emotional distress, uh, enslavement, literally violating the 13th Amendment. You can sue for that. So yeah, there could be more. Gabby, yeah. do you have any um, that you would want to add? I mean, I am thinking um, in the same vein as my poor, poor empire employees and first order employees, that this is hostile work environment. This is the absolute worst conditions. They have been enslaved. Um, this is um, not just kidnapping. This is false imprisonment. Um, this is forced labor. So you have trafficking uh, kind of implications here. Um, and, and it's important to note, you would have several kind of, not just domestic issues as far as things you could sue, like enslavement, like um, constitutional issues and, and the like, but you have a lot, you are, we're kind of in territory of violating a lot of international conventions here. 
um, and, you know, just working conditions um, and, you know, a lot of things that would go against kind of international jurisdictions. Super problematic. Now, the there's one issue with drafting the complaint. The next is where do we file the complaint, which means we need to do the usual issues of where is the right place, you know, in established jurisdiction to so we know where to file. The wrinkle here is people were taken from different points in time. So where is the injury occurring? And there's a good argument that the injury occurs where they were taken, which means you could have people scattered across the timeline. That makes suing weird because we believe in th things like precedence and the idea of multiple cases all involving the same controversy, different injuries because of like when they were taken, but being able to sue, say, over 500 years worth of events, <laughs> that, that's just weird. Because, you know, if it's, if somebody was taken from, say, England in the 1600s, like, do, do they want to bring, you know, their case then? Or would you want to do it post blip? Because at least that way, you know, half the population died and then came back. So the, juries are going to be way easier to deal with in being able to go like, oh, okay, so secret time organization? Yeah, we're on board. We can handle that knowledge as opposed to trying to explain that to 1950s America and people going, what the hell are you talking about? So there's that because you want the jury to believe you. So the forum shopping that would need to take place here gets very, very confusing. You Although, have a lot of analysis. What, what are your yeah. thoughts? <laughs> so I have to say, um, you know, it's funny because our, our listeners don't get to see our, our very detailed um, outlines that we do. But I got I was I was happy because I got to pull a lot of notes. Um, this is from my um, actually international law class in law school. I went back and I pulled from my outline from that class. Because uh, as soon as you mentioned jurisdiction, I'm thinking international law um, and kind of the different balancing tests that happen. Because what you see in international law a lot is um, the idea of different conflicting jurisdictions, right? You have the, the territory where someone was injured. Um, you may have the territory um, where the uh, offender is from, you have the territory where the victim is from, you may have other states, we're using state and nation interchangeably here, um, where, you know, that may have an interest in this conflict. Um, so there's actually, um, it is the restatement third of foreign relations law, um, and it goes over a lot of these kind of conflict issues uh, that come up in um, international law, and actually restatement 403 uh, talks about the interest balancing jurisdictional test. Uh, so what what will happen is they'll defer to any whichever state or nation nation state has the significantly greatest interest. Uh, so th things they'll look at is ties to the conduct um, ties the conduct to the territory of the regulating state. Um, you know where the person who was victimized is from, uh, character of the regulated activity, impact of the regulation or the the activity. Um, so there's a lot of different um, items and factors that they'll look at um, in determining where jurisdiction happens. The other thing that I was thinking is because you could kind of look at this and say, you know, each timeline, each year has kind of equal um, interest because they are all you know, where the victims are from necessarily. The offender in this case is an out of time agency, is its own kind of governmental organization. It could be considered even its own uh, nation state. So my thinking is, is you would have to get kind of an equal um, something, a court um, that's on equal footing with the TVA. Um, to bring this action against them. Um, because we have seen kind of 
individual nation states uh, take on these types of cases. But we also do have um, in real life, you know, international, like the International Criminal Court, uh, the International Court of Justice um, that handle these kind of larger kind of uh, multiple uh, interest involved uh, issues. You know, as Mark Zia likes to, to point out, he sued Iran for. <laughs> so, yeah, we also don't know who is actually in charge at the TVA. So for being a nation state, it's different. It's more an agency that's mm -hmm. taken on a life of its own. Uh, so it is very, very odd, uh, but I, I would dig in on the issue of the United States does not like its citizens being taken and pressed into service. We fought a war in 1812 over that. So the United States has a interest in protecting any of its people and to mm -hmm. kind of bring in an element from the, the final countdown, you know, we will defend our country no matter when it, it has taken place. So yeah, we'll want them back and we want them to come home. Yeah, and the other thing you might look at is, I know this happens a lot with, um, you know, sci-fi stories and, and fantasy stories tend to be very United States centric, um, but you would look at also from where, which, nation has the highest amount of TVA variants? Is it the United States? Is it England? Is it, you know, presume we don't know the only TVA agent we've seen the background of is um, C20. And we don't know where she was from. Obviously, they're speaking English, but most of the world speaks English. And again, we talked about this before, they could simply be speaking English because that's you know, how it gets kind of easiest process to an American audience, but, you know, they could be anywhere. And that would be another factor that the court would look at is who has the most kind of victims. Again, it, it really comes down to who has the biggest um, interest in this fight, who has the biggest stake in this fight. Um, and that's usually where the, the kind of in the jurisdictional land um, well thought and well said and that gets into just the first part for jurisdiction and <laughs> where where are we going to sue and if, if somebody was taken from san francisco in 2019 all right we'll go with federal court there because there's an interest and we can tie it the that the northern district to where the harm took place and the person who was who was taken. That doesn't mean like we could bring it just in Virginia, you know, in, in federal court there, because I would think this would be federal because of the, the human trafficking elements that are taking place. But there definitely could be, um, there's state issues that I would bring in into a lawsuit uh, as well, such as like loss of consortium. Uh, those who, have, you know, who had family members that were taken and then the universe reset they're probably upset about, I, I had a kid, what? So things that, that can make people go, I've suffered in loss. Yeah. Now, what year would be the right year to bring the lawsuit? Date taken makes sense, but that raises the issue of, do you want somebody filing a federal lawsuit in 1890? Although it does raise the question, if you have, this is getting really trippy, so I apologize, but if you, <laughs> you have somebody file a case in 1820, um, does that then become precedent because it was filed prior to, let's say a victim in 2014? That would be the governing rule, or should you file them all at one time because they do exist out of time and space and supposedly you would find them all at the same time um and so would it go from the time you found them so that you don't have this kind of built in almost like gaming the system you know dropping them back in their timelines to set up this precedent 
um, it, it would be easier procedurally if they all landed in Seattle in 2021. Like it's mm -hmm. like, okay, you're all here. That's great. Do it. <laughs> uh, wh where were you from originally? Louisiana in the 1870s? Well, we're okay. Tough. You're here now. <laughs> so that was procedurally easier. Putting them back where they came from could be disruptive on so many universal levels. And the lawsuits would be taking place throughout history at that point. And being human beings who live a finite amount of time, it's not like they're taking place contemporaneously, even though are they? a time traveler could argue they were. That's why you could have one lawyer <laughs> argue all of them over two centuries. <laughs> but that that's just so complicated and funky. I would, I mean, that would be, that would lessen their injury because they're going back to what they know, what they, where they came from, who their best friend was, who their spouse was potentially, you know, if they had kids, which then fundamentally alters that timeline because the kids who didn't have a parent now do. So there's a lot to unpack there. It would be easier if, if they were all liberated and came to the same point in time. Again, present day, post blip would be easier to deal with, or at least post snap, because again, they're, the universe is now accepting of like, okay, so uh, there's a secret space organization outside of time doing this. All right. Now we, we had this crazy alien with magic rocks wipe out half of all existence. So we're on board. Like you yeah. don't have to explain it to us. And who knows? I mean, in MCU kind of world, if we're taking it very literally and very, you know, very much based in our own reality, as we saw in uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, uh, they seem to have set up this weird, not United Nations, but something else of, you know, inter um, country pact type thing to make decisions with regards to the returned persons. Um, so they may well, you know, after we're what, a 10 years, I don't know how that translates. I know theoretically we're in 2024 in the MCU timeline, um, but they could have set up after Avengers and then, um, you know, Ultron and then the Sokovia Accords um, and then Thanos there could have been an, a meeting of, you know, go, uh, international leaders that says we need to set up something equivalent to the International Criminal Court, International Court of Justice, to be able to deal with these types of crimes and, you know, misdeeds that really does not fall under any jurisdiction. That we've seen that happen. Like that happens in response to things the the way the landscape we have now is established based on a world that doesn't have chitari invasions and thanos and you know all of that so we don't have that in our you know reality here but certainly i can see you know international leaders coming together and say we really need to create something to address that that's how we got the international criminal court of justice that's how we got the um you know different things, even the UN, that's how we got that was, you know, countries coming together to work together to address an issue. Which brings us to our next element in our fictional lawsuit against the TVA, service of process. <laughs> so they're supposed to be all knowing and all seeing. So, you know, they got the Santa Claus thing going for them. Yep. All right, so personal service normally involves a process server going and serving them. You know, in theory, they could have a register agent that would accept process, but they're the super secret time organization that doesn't want to have its existence disclosed because that itself would alter reality and time. 
So ser serving them is a challenge because getting a process server to go there is difficult short of having a Nexus event and getting taken in, but that's that's a different issue. Uh, are they in the quantum realm, which means can Ant-Man have a side job for doing process serving? <laughs> Uh, I can totally see that happening, though. Like, Ant-Man opens the side business of being a process server. Yeah, <laughs> for, the, for all the agencies and all the different little cities in the quantum realm, uh, that's his side gig. I, and I could see Paul Rudd doing it, too. So and, Much uh, better than working at Baskin Robbins. Much better. <laughs> it's, I mean, you've been a good paying gig. So... <laughs> I mean, clearly a lot of people to go after, but again, we don't know who there is going to accept service. So this could turn into an issue where service by publication makes sense because mm -hmm. they're supposed to be monitoring the timeline. They're going to see it this way. And that handles the issue of trying to find the secret space lizards who turned out to be androids. And we don't know who the puppet master is yet. So, yeah. Uh, and I mean, I should say, Service of process is difficult on a normal day. Um, anybody who's ever done um, personal injury or family law knows that trying to track down somebody uh, to serve them, um, and and it should be noted that that uh, service uh, service of process by publication um, depends on um, the jurisdiction. Um, I think also what the issue at hand is. Uh, because there are certain th things that you need to, the person needs to receive the um, summons and complaint and such in hand, um, and tracking down those people is difficult. Um, but this is not uncommon. Um, I mean, obviously we have, you know, rule four of serving uh, government uh, corporations, agencies, the like, um, it's, you know, government employees. Um, but we also, I was doing a bit of digging because I was like, we have to have been able to serve like other countries and people in other countries um, because that happens all the time where you have people um, who are in a different country, they're foreign nationals, um, who are parties to certain cases. Um, and we do. There's actually two um, among several other documents, uh, but there is something called the Hague Service Convention, um, which again, going back to that idea of things created uh, by international leaders um, to, to address a problem. Um, the Hague Service Convention uh, was ratified in 1969 to make service amongst um, countries and international service easier. Um, it's a kind of expedited, simplified means of serving parties um, in between states that are party to the convention. So currently there are 79 states that are part of the convention. Um, and it just, it requires um, the state, the, the nation state uh, to designate a central authority uh, to accept incoming requests for service. And then it goes through kind of a whole chain and they confirm it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I could see the TVA for all its bureaucracy, they, they have somebody like this. They have at least somebody who kind of communicates with the outside world. They are kind of the pinnacle of bureaucracy. So I can see them having somebody set up to receive their mail. <laughs> it makes sense. And somebody's got to be outside counsel. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So a lot to unpack there with, with service of process. And uh, I liked all the historical dates that you worked in on how that works. Now, there's another factor that I think we should discuss with what the TVA does to people. It's a little worse than summary executions that they do. They send people to the void, this end of time, no man's land. And I mean, it's, it's different than Limbo that we saw in the comics where Mortis had his lair. And you have this collision of remnant branches, since not all the matter could be destroyed, but anyone who gets per, uh, pruned gets sent there. 
this is cruel and unusual punishment because it's one thing to just execute somebody, granted with very much a kangaroo court. It's another thing to sentence them to the worst Mad Max Thunderdome reality where they could get murdered by cannibals. Yeah, and, and I think that's that's the key thing is they, um, you know, they don't just kind of send them to the end of reality. And this may be, you know, the lack of thinking on the TVA's part, who knows, but because there's no food source, there's no operations, um, I, I don't understand how, um, you know, we see them drinking, um, the Lokis drinking rocks wine. Um, so I don't know how they were able to procure that. Um, if there's really, I guess there, maybe there are very in the pruned branches. We, we know that the timeline kind of the reset reset kind of encapsulates a lot of things. So maybe there's minimal food sources that end up there. Um, and certainly um, pollution wise, that seemed to be where uh, the TVA sends their lunch trays uh, from their cafeteria, which I guess you could say that there may be some food scraps on there. They don't dump them in any way. They just apparently prune their lunch trays, um, which is hor they basically sent these people to a garbage dump um for a wasteland garbage dump at the end of time um and expected them to i don't know and and also not just lack of food resources there's a giant whatever you want to call elias that eats people as soon as they get there so they either run or get eaten um or then they get eaten by the cannibals um so yeah it's not it's not a good place no it's not <laughs> it's no it's just scraps of reality landing so it's not like hey a, you know a pizza joint lands oh that'd be convenient you know or you know going through the wreckage of the Eldridge to see what survived like there's like and it looked like kid loki had a device to at least predict where a breach was going to take place and something to land. So yeah, uh, but yeah, it's very, very cruel and very unusual. Because <laughs> if you want unusual, yeah, we this found- This would be the, 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 the textbook definition, for sure, for sure. New textbook definition, so um, yeah, yeah. Now that said, there is a lot of Easter eggs in this episode. Just to highlight a couple, the Thanos copter from Squirrel Girl, where she takes down Thanos, who's flying in a helicopter and arrests him. So there's that. We see the wreckage of a Kree ship, possibly the Dark Aster, so cool. We see a crashed helicarrier off in the distance. There's Frog Thor and Molmir, and that frog would have to get out of that jar at some point in time. But again, talk about frustrating. And what I, I think is is great, and this is my little kind of film reference um, for for the pot today's podcast is that I think they used the same audio of uh, Chris Hemsworth kind of falling around the glass cage that he was in in Avengers for Frog Thor jumping around the little glass jar. So if they did or kind of tweaked it in such a way, kudos, because that was awesome. Well done, well done. And the way they, they just work in Walt Simonson's stories from Thor is, well, Simonson wrote the definitive Thor stories. So there's that. Uh, and. Uh, it works well, uh, but that would have to be super frustrating uh, to to just be trapped in there. And how did he get pruned? Like, I think was that just like some sucked in uh, to a, from a branch reality or what? So, what's the story there? I was especially ecstatic to see the USS Eldridge which comes from, it's a hoax story, 
but the story was about the Philadelphia experiment, which purportedly was the Navy attempting to make the USS Eldridge radar invisible. It happened in October of 1943 in Philadelphia Harbor. They, there was a movie called The Philadelphia Experiment in the mid 80s, that's, that's a good flick. There is uh, references to it in a um, Bermuda Triangle miniseries that was on sci-fi and it's a hoax the eldridge was never in philadelphia when the you know alleged experiment took place but it's a fun thing from pop culture that we now work into things and they did in this episode the sailors are in the right type of uniforms from world war ii so that was kind of fun to see so they didn't botch that and it's like cool, like the the idea that the experiment drops the ship at the end of time. It's like, oops, <laughs> so did not work the way they wanted it to. Uh, so there was a lot of there there with that. Did you catch any other Easter eggs? Because it you know with all the wreckage, I mean there's yeah, there's a lot. Um... There's, I think I saw the head of the living tribunal um, in one of the many shots of kind of wasteland um, area. Um, there was also reference to the Polybius uh, game, which was an urban legend um, from the Portland, Oregon area in the 2000s. Um, it was a game uh, that was supposedly indoctrinating people and had psycho um, active and addictive effects on people. I'm not sure if it actually existed, but um, there was kind of this whole government conspiracy indoctrinating people um, along with the game. Um, and then, yeah, there's there's just a lot. And obviously um, the President Loki kind of, it wasn't the full uh, President Loki storyline, but you know, to get a little bit of it was great. Um, I, I was kind of a little sad that it was no more than kind of we got in the trailer, um, but it was it was just cool to see. I think it was a bit ridiculous and you know silly and and I think honestly the whole episode was just an excuse to get all these kind of crazy Easter eggs into one episode, um, which I wasn't mad about. Like I wasn't I didn't like hate it. I kind of knew the purpose of the episode. Um, and the other little Easter egg that I liked, um, which it kind of triggered something in the back of my brain the first time I watched it, and then I was reading some stuff and it clicked, um, was when classic Loki is uh, reestablishing uh, the Asgard um, projection, um, which looks a lot like the Wizard of Oz. That to me was awesome that they are, you know, uncovering the man behind the curtain and this thing looks like Oz. Um, but the song that plays is, um, Ride of the Valkyries. And that was super cool. Like, I was just like, you know, it was such a kind of badass scene. And then to have that, um, you know, knowing that we have Valkyries and in the Thor legends and, you know, not just Norse mythology, but MCU and Marvel, um, mythology was just, oh, it was super cool. So catch the music so you have a very talented ear for that yeah so. I, I read like the song was like one of those things in the back of my in my head i was like this song sounds familiar and then i was i was reading stuff and i was like ah oh, yes so that that made sense but it was just because it didn't it didn't it triggered something because it didn't sound like traditional the mcu really does not sample a lot of they have their own themes and their own uh motifs that they've put together um, but they really don't sample a lot of, you know, kind of classical music or, um, you know, apart from Guardians of the Galaxy kind of has their own soundtrack, um, but and their own, you know, universe. But um, general Marvel does not do things like that. So I was like, this sounds way too familiar. <laughs> I was, you know, what, I, I watched the episode twice and what I was engulfed with thinking about was we're seeing several Lokis have true character growth. 
So we go from the scene in the bowling alley where we see the traditional Loki betray everyone. So mm -hmm. Loki can't even trust another Loki. And in this, we see classic Loki to a degree, kid Loki, they and, and Sylvie and our Loki all learn to trust people, learn to make friends. Yeah. That, and, that scene at the end, just when he hugged Mobius, I mean, that to be on this journey with this character and especially knowing that this is the character, this is, this is 2012 Loki. This is not Loki who's kind of gone to battle with Thor and has kind of evolved over a period of years. Like this is still very close in time to that Avengers Loki. And, and to see that was just like, it, it meant a lot. I was like, I just wish we had gotten the Thor Loki hug <laughs> that was talked about in Ragnarok. Um, and on top of that, this Loki did uh, mature quickly because he, he did watch his own death. He watched mm -hmm. his parents die and he saw a resolution with his brother. So, you you know, his growth was, on some level was um, expedited because yeah. it's like he saw how his life ended and he saw all that, you know, wow, I got my mom killed. You know, he doesn't know the extent that he's responsible for his dad's death, but and Ragnarok, you know, but like that would have added significant guilt if he had if he had learned about that on top of it. But uh, he goes through a lot of growth, and the fact that it it's like he's the one who initiates the hug with Mobius. Mm -hmm. It's like okay, he's learned to trust other people. So the liar who manipulates is willing to open up to others and also willing to sacrifice himself uh, in a fight as well. Yeah. And, and cl classic Loki does exactly that in a very uh, uh, method that's true to, you know, thinking back to the mid eighties and Simonson's art and storytelling, it's like, this seems like right out of a comic. Mm -hmm. with, and Richard E. Grant is just such a superb actor. You know, his facial expressions and, and yelling glorious purpose. It's, it's just, and, and that man knows how to wear a cape. Yeah, that if, if anybody else had put that outfit on, I think it would have looked absolutely ridiculous. But I think he carried the seriousness of it um, in a way that was unexpected. Um, yeah, and that that scene, I mean, that image of, um, you know, Asgard bathed in kind of this green light and him bending down, you know, really looked like it was taken, t taken straight off, you know, a comic book cover. And honestly, for me, <laughs> I was going to say this earlier at the, at the top of the episode, but I think this is the next phase. You know, we've, we've started to see the oh kind of working a way in to put somebody in their like traditional costume because like we're not going to put it on screen because it looks kind of ridiculous but we'll find a way to work it in whether that you know we saw that in um daredevil you know the the netflix marvel series with luke cage and jessica jones and we've seen it with scarlet witch uh we saw it in kind of the cw series um but I think the next step is these kind of recreating these iconic kind of comic book pictures, basically, you know, kind of frames. Um, you know, we saw it with um, with the Superman and Lois series, um, you know, get, getting this. I think it's very it's something that you could freeze that and turn it into art. I think it's it's really kind of powerful. It's in addition to everything you just said, it's it's the embrace of the source material and it's not being ashamed of the source material. It's going, all right, we can make this work. And they dig in and figure out how to make it work. Yeah. And it's like, let's have somebody with gravitas do this. And again, the ex Richard E. Grant's facial expressions in that fight is glorious it is just 
it's like you go boy uh rock on you clearly had fun with this and i don't know if he read old comics or not but it was just like hell yeah this that's how it's done yeah it's it's finding a balance i think between the large kind of cinematic um you know but also nodding back to you know the classics like where this came from and it doesn't you can do it in a way that's not hokey that's not cheesy that's you know it doesn't have to be the whole production but it's it's a way to just kind of give that nod give that kind of respect um and and i really i really like it um the other i was going to say before i forget the, the other easter egg i noticed and it was so funny because i don't think i saw pretty much none of the breakdowns I saw mentioned this Easter egg, which I was surprised. Um, but both my friend and I caught it um, because we're major Disney millennials. Um, is the Pizza Planet reference. The Pizza Planet reference was made my heart sing. That is Disney fully embracing Marvel um, for those people who know there's usually a pizza planet um, reference in most Pixar films. Um, they squeeze it in there somehow, um, obviously a nod to the original Toy Story um, with the pizza, pizza planet truck um, or pizza planet delivery car. Um, so the fact that they snuck this in and it was all it needed was like that circle. <laughs> But I'd, I'd take it. I'd take it the way it was. Um, and the fact that Mobius was kind of driving it around and the sign was flying all over the place was just amazing. So definitely did not see a lot of people call that one out, but I liked it. I mean, it wasn't, I, I liked that it was a little subtler uh, than the um, Age of Ultron trailers that used the Pinocchio music. So that was, that was a little better. <laughs> That's how I like my Disney Incorporated into Marvel. <laughs> Not very like hammer, just subtle. Good catch, good catch, and the, and the at a movie theater, uh, movie drive-in as well. So that was um, there. What when Sylvie lands in the school bus in that nest? It reminded me of Cue the Winged Serpent, which is '80s horror movie esque. It was on Amazon Prime, and it it just seemed familiar. And a grant in that the nest was in one was in the Chrysler Building, and one's in a, like an abandoned warehouse. And it kind of reminded me of the, of the last one because we see eggs that are in it. So it's like, so I I had that vibe. I don't know if that was intentional mm -hmm. or not, but something a big creature built a nest in a school bus, and that's where she lands uh that was just cool the yeah there's so much to unpack i mean it just to visually go through and go like okay what's this flying saucer from like that has to be from something as opposed to just a generic flying saucer. again yeah, a lot there uh yeah and yeah. I think though, I think that was kind of the purpose of the episode, like I said, was to have all these Easter eggs, but I think they did it in a way that like you kind of knew what you were getting into and it didn't, I, like I said, I wasn't mad about it. My favorite part though, hands down, Alligator Loki. Team Alligator Loki all the way. That's the Florida Flirt in, in me. I loved Alligator Loki, um, especially that he bit off uh, <laughs> President Loki's arm. That was such a good kind of hilarious gag that I did not think they would run with in kind of a dramatic show like this of just the, you know, the music playing and everybody's kind of running around and kind of almost like slap comedy. Um, I, I, I really appreciate that. But yeah, Alligator Loki is hilarious. It reminded me of Batman 66 fight scenes because uh, of the way the set looked with the candy yeah. canes and everything. It looked like a, you know, a, a very campy bad guy set from the Batman and Robin show of, of mm -hmm. the late 60s. Yeah, there's a lot of really fun things in this episode that 
Uh, when you highlight the labor of love that this is, there was also a, a cast photo that's been circulating where it shows the cast uh, and they're cutting into a, an alligator Loki cake. And it's just like, oh, you guys look super fun to hang out with. Like, this is well done. You knew you were making magic and you had fun with it at the wrap party. So God yeah. bless you all. Uh, I think though, speculation wise, I'm putting it out there. I'm putting my chips in with all the other nerds. I think Kang the Conqueror is behind all this. <laughs> I think this is, this is to me, towing a little bit of the line um, with the the kind of power broker reveal um, that, you know, that was kind of very, the most obvious dramatic reveal in the history of obvious dramatic reveals. Um, but I think, you know, the fact that you have um, Ravona Renslayer, you have Elioth, um, you have these kind of uh, ancient artifacts in this kind of void area, like the Sphinx um, that is in Chronopolis. And then you have this city that's revealed, and especially the, the area that both Sylvie sees in her vision, and the area that kind of pulls back to reveal very much looks like the quantum realm. I mean, if it's not... <laughs> so I think I... Kang makes the most sense. I don't know if they're going to go there to reveal Kang the Conqueror in this. If they did, that would be super bold of them prior to the Ant-Man and the Wasp movie. Uh, I would love it if they did. Part of me, the the rainbow lights to, the, to it did remind me some of Asgard. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's another Loki hmm. that's at the end of time doing this so they fight themselves which again goes back to that adam warlock theme of warlock versus him mm -hmm. and him with a capital h uh or or magnus <laughs> you know like i could that also would make sense just from the way that they've done this with there are so many loki's and that it was one of that was two that founded the tva i could see that being a thing but I would I, I would like it to be Kang or Immortus because mm -hmm. they're Kang becomes Immortus. And if it was Kang, they could work in the fact that Kang went to war with all the variant Kangs. And that was in a, a huge Avengers storyline where uh, Kang set out to kill all the variant Kangs and thought he did and then it's kang versus mortis so that would be a nice call back if they do i mean that. yeah and narratively that would make sense that you have um one the antagonist is the one who's eliminated all of the variants of himself whereas our hero loki is the one who's aligned himself with all of his various copies. He sees the strengths in all of them um, instead of kind of, because, and I think that's part of his growth, right? He starts the series by saying, I am the superior Loki. And at the end, he's working with the various Lokis. There's no more of that language of lesser versus superior. Um, so I think that would be pretty cool. Agreed. And, because none of them are superior. I, I think they, I think he recognized that during the barroom fight with the other versions of himself. And the look <laughs> on his face is like, oh no, like this is, you know, like they you can't even trust each other, which is why, you know, he escapes with the guys that he escapes with. It's like, nope, we're out of here. Like we're yeah. done with this crap. You know, it's self destructive which is why this is such a unique character study that I was not ex expecting it to turn into sending the message that people can change. You can be wh whoever you want to be. The growth and learning about others, making friends, learning, I just, somebody believes in you. All of that is everything great about 
comic storytelling and the fact that they're doing it with such gusto and uh, competency is so refreshing uh, to see and because it's not ham fisted. Yes. It's not saying like racism bad, like it's, you know, it's like not doing it in a, a blockheaded manner. Yeah, uh, it's it's subtle, but it's there. And I think, you know, given the fact that this is a character we've been on an adventure with for almost 10 years, I think that's, you'd have to be kind of blind not to see the growth that he's gone, both in the MCU itself, and also the fact that this is, again, the 2012 Loki that's kind of on this expedited, um, you know, fast track growth. Um, and, I, and I think it's true, you know, seeing that somebody can change. I think we've seen that move in the MCU towards the more uh, multifaceted villains. And I love it, like, because that's real life. That's, you know, you don't have you know there's obviously there's people who are evil because they're evil but i think the majority of people have multiple reasons they just went down i think that's what's always been fascinating about you know especially kind of fantasy sci-fi storytelling is that the heroes and villains are very similar but for the choices they made you know and i think that's much more powerful storytelling i i also find it very entertaining that when our Loki decides I'm going to do the right thing. So he, he emulates his brother with let's go kill a Like that, <laughs> that seems a very poor <laughs> plan. Yeah. And so it's like, well, <laughs> he doesn't outright say my, what would my brother do? He would sneak up from behind and kill it. He would yeah. find a way cause that's what he does. And in, you know, being reunited with Sylvie, it's like, that was your plan? Like, it's, do you, have you seen that thing? Like, and, and, but again, like watching him, watching the creature eliminate the crew of the uh, Eldridge, like they changed their tune very quickly with like, okay, that's a bad plan. We're going to go figure yeah. out something else. <laughs> yeah, Time to regroup. <laughs> we got to rethink this. And, uh, <laughs> So well done. So well done. So we'll see how this ends. And I, I really cannot express how much I've enjoyed this and how creative it is. And also the success of short form storytelling. Yes. That I, I mean, I love the Netflix shows, but I thought they were too long. Like they all should have been six to eight episodes. Mm -hmm. Defenders was the right length. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, like the third episode is the characters having dinner and that's brilliant. And you know, they're at a, hiding out at a Chinese food place and, and having dinner. Well done. First season of Daredevil, brilliant, but there were filler episodes. Mm -hmm. Like they, they all do that. And this doesn't. So like, yeah. so six episodes going like here's the tight story we're going to tell the story there's going to be character development and there'll be quiet moments and there'll be big moments and we'll be done like we're not going to do a filler episode of loki goes grocery shopping like we're not going to do any of that stuff it's going to yeah because you don't you don't need it you nope. i it it really granted i would love <laughs> Just like I would love more episodes of WandaVision, I would love more episodes of Loki. But at the end of the day, it's it's trimming the, the fat of the the you know uh, the storytelling and and making it that clear, concise, boom, boom, boom. And and I think too, what works for it is it's it's short but long form storytelling because they've planned this out. They you know we've seen this not just with Loki but with WandaVision. Uh, even on, on the Star Wars sides with Mandalorian, that there's a plan from beginning to end and they divide it up. Okay, here's stop one, stop two, stop three, stop four. And here's how we're going to get through it. Um, and it just, but it, it, it's a longer form, but it because it's concise, 
it's it's digestible and it's just it's a great way of storytelling we've all we've spent time on the tva like they've really like had fun with that late 60s 70s technology that looks like mission control or a tv station control room <laughs> and it, it, it brings back memories of my childhood to some degree even though that was early 80s but still it's like there were echoes of it but it's like huh the time court you know painting like the, the way that they have the name written it's like very there's a vintage quality to it that works very well so this this show has character and his character development was someone who's a villain who is misunderstood who learns how to trust people and work with others that's exceptional mm -hmm. so with that looking forward to how this ends and and how it what it springboards do does, yes. does it springboard to any of the other upcoming movies because it seems like it's it can yeah well we we have been told that this will fundamentally change the mcu as we know it so kevin feige better come big with that promise <laughs> of fundamentally changing or i'm going to be sending that man a thesaurus of what fundamental change means so I, I think that changes. Look, we now know how Loki survived. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? That um, do we get the variant still running around, or does he land in his own uh, post? You know, like what would be present day for us? Well, actually, future for us, but present day for the MCU. Like, how are they going to do that? And. Um, so we'll see. We will definitely see where they go with it. Uh, but we've heard the big talk before. Um, <laughs> and I don't, the multiverse is fun, but I prefer everything still being like one line as opposed to, we're going to do a branch with different movies now. Like that, mm, I hope they don't go there. <laughs> But that's, uh... I, I think I think if they learn their lesson from Into the Spider-Verse, it can be done well. And it can be done as long as it does not become the kind of, like you said, like, oh, there's this timeline with its own movie, you know, this and here and, 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 and whatever. But if it comes like we're still in the primary timeline, you know, the so-called sacred timeline, but at the same time, we have these possibilities to kind of pull these different storylines, characters, versions of characters, you know, to the primary timeline. I think that's how it works. I think that's how it works because then it opens this whole universe of um, storytelling options. But it doesn't, it can't be hokey. It can't be, you know, kind of a, a device. Yeah, um, they, they should learn from DC's mistakes. So, which I think they have. <laughs> yeah, I think I, the bright quality of WandaVision <laughs> and Loki was definitely a not so subtle uh, gesture uh, <laughs> to, to the Snyderverse and to the uh, DC e, the DCEU. I think that's what it's called these days. Um, yeah, it's like, hey, we had a neck snap. Notice how we did it. Yeah. <laughs> Notice it wasn't a good guy doing it. So yeah. there yeah. you go. Uh, and not everyone needs angst. So you don't need to bring the, the brightness down to 10 in your movies because we'd like to see things. Just putting it out there. Just a thing, you know, <laughs> give it a try. Colors are nice. <laughs> right. Not everything has to be rainy. Just give it a shot. So, uh, yeah. and like, and if we're going to have a guy fight a cloud, notice you'll be able to see things. There you go. Um, yeah. And our, our cloud monster makes sense, JJ. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to you. 
Um, <laughs> clearly, they had a plan. So with that, uh, everyone, thanks for tuning Plans in. Plans are good. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, stay tuned for more as we get into Bad Batch later this evening. And uh, Gabby, definitely Gabby and I will be back next week for uh, Loki, possibly with others, depending on everyone's schedules. So with that, everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay geeky. Take care, all.